Good morning, everyone. Oh, you know what? I just realized something. I didn't put the right chat thing in here. Let me uh, pop that out real quick and put the right chat in there. While I'm doing that, because already the chat is lit right now, the chat is going nuts already, and I haven't started my stream yet. So before we get started, uh, one thing is different about me right now. Let's see who the first person is. You could tell what is different. Um, go for it. And why I actually changed the chat here, because I forgot to do that. You guys can actually get this on the stream while well, people... Um, lose their minds in this particular problem. Because that's what it's designed to do. It's actually designed to make people go uh, utterly insane. Uh, and it does. So, all right, there's my uh, alert box there. Let me change this. No, that's not the right box. There we go. That's the right one. Now you guys should be able to see the chat coming up here. There we go. <clears throat> there, there it is. Yes, uh, tree fig line. Yes, new glasses. Thank you. Um, these are there's actually two lenses in here. Yes, so these are brand new. Uh, even got a, a nice little lens case for, or you know, protective lens case and a softy, uh, so it doesn't scratch things up. Look at that uh, styling. So, all right. So kind of let's kind of dive into this. Let me give you a little backstory that you guys may or may not be aware of. Um, on Facebook, this actually was a huge problem about ten years back. Matter of fact, I was uh, intricately involved on Facebook, heavily explaining this problem as far as a decade ago. I met some great people that way. Matter of fact, I'm still friends with one of them, uh, Amanda, that's on my Facebook page. We met because of this particular problem. And by the way, she did agree with me. Probably why I get along with her, you know. Yeah, I had to put my glasses on for this, my, my nerdy Mac glasses. Although I got to tell you, things are crisp. I can actually read this. This is like a whole different world. I mean, you got to remember my old glasses, uh, well, I, I put them away. My old glasses had one lens and it was already a bad prescription. So this is like a whole new world for me. So uh, who's messaging me? Uh, okay, so I, I wanted to kind of give you a backstory of why this problem has been around for so long. And yes, I've talked about it before, but this was a very long time ago. And people are saying it's about time maybe we do um, a stream on it again to explain why, why this does solve for nine. Uh, this problem has been around because basically a lot of people learn different conventions. If you are an engineer, you tend to learn a different convention from what is standard, what's called the standard order of operations. People remember that as PEMDAS. You know, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. So what happens is, is they learn some math, they learn some engineering, they learn some physics, and then when they see something like this, they use the convention that was taught to them by whatever school they went to or whatever the teacher had preferred or whatever journal they were reading. Many physics books use a different convention other than standard order or operations. And there's reasons for this. The reasons why is because when you're writing in a journal and you're writing in an inline notation, sometimes it's easier to write a specific way for typesetting and for whatever. And they'll tell you how to interpret it. They'll tell you how to parse it, right? They'll say, you know, assume implicit higher than explicit, or assume that um, a variable will bond more to the coefficient with an implicit multiplication, which is called implied multiplication by juxtaposition. But that's not standard. That is a different convention. When you're learning arithmetic, right? When you're learning school level maths, and this goes back to fifth grade. This is, these are very similar fifth grade problems. If you have kids that are fifth grade, they're going to be learning it this way, which is the standard, called standard order of operations. When they see a problem on a standardized test like this, the expected answer, the expected solution is nine. So no matter how you've learned it, how you think it is, how you think it's, this problem solves for one, it makes no difference if you're having a child that's in the mathematical system, you know, learning math in especially Common Core in California, which by the way does, does suck, but they're going to be taught that, that this is solved for nine. Now again, you solve an equation, which means you have an equal sign, you evaluate an expression without one. Um, you may have learned it like BODAS, BIDMAS, BEDMAS, PPMDAS, these are all the same exact things. The acronym just gives you a mnemonic to help you understand the rules of which you go by to, uh, it's not even rules, it's just like, again, it's a convention, um, to evaluate or to solve a particular problem. But they're very confusing because they're not taught very well. Uh, PEMDAS, people say, we well, have to do multiplication first because it's P-E-M-D-A-S. Well, no, it's multiplication or division as read, life, read left to right. In other words, if the multiplication comes first in, in the expression, you evaluate that first. If the division comes first, you evaluate that first. But multiplication and division are reciprocal functions, right? I mean, they're the same function, just the reciprocation of the other. They have to have the same hierarchy. Addition and subtraction are reciprocal functions. They have to have the same 
uh, hierarchy. And again, these, these hold true when you start uh, getting into real analysis because you have what's called like the multiplicative identity, which is one. So if you have a multiplication and, and a, div a division, that's going to equal to one. Uh, so you, you, have, you, have to, you have to realize that these are just a reciprocal of, of each other. And so if multiplication cannot be, have any higher precedence over division. Division cannot have any higher precedence over multiplication. It's whatever comes first. So, uh, yeah, I have some links to these, these, these things. Uh, I used to have a lot more uh, in my life chat asking for links. Yeah, I, I have examples here I'll give you. Um, but yeah, if you actually, I've actually have found tests that actually use these types of equations in fifth and sixth grade maths level. Um, and they're just written exactly like this. Matter of fact, one of them was uh, uh, on a blog that was, uh, the expected answer was 11. The, they, the, the parents said it was two. The teacher explained why it's 11. This is what you expected to, to, to know. So let me explain kind of why. In the standard convention for the standard of our order of operations, when you evaluate, well, actually, when you solve this problem, right, you would normally do P first, which is the parentheses, right? This is called parenthetical group. Now, again, you don't have to. Again, PEMDAS, it doesn't mean you must absolutely, if you're, you know, do P first. It just means that you're going to get a wrong, might, you may get a wrong answer if you don't. But I could do the division here first and then the P and I'll get the same answer, right? But let's say I do the, the parentheses, the parenthetical group first. That's going to give me a 3. So it's going to be 6 divided by 2 times 3. Between the parenthetical group, the 2 and 3, there's an implied binary operator there that operates on two operands. That is called an implied multiplication or implicit multiplication. And the, the full name for it is implicit, implied multiplication by juxtaposition, meaning that they're next to each other. In mathematics, there is nothing, there is absolutely no rule whatsoever that gives implied, math, implied multiplication any higher um, order of precedence than explicit. Go look, you will not find one. What it is is, a con again, a convention that some calculators use, some, some physics manuals use, some class is used, like Sharp uses a, a different convention, TI, some TIs use a different convention, but this is a notational convention that's saying, okay, if you have a quantity of something with the coefficient, that's going to bind differently. But in that particular case, that formula has changed. You've now added essentially brackets around this part of the, of the equation here, the two parentheses, one plus two, which will evaluate for one. But that's not the same equation. When you have an obelisk here, Right? And originally the obelisk was a typesetting thing. Um, and um, yes, it denotes you know, one thing over another, like A over B or P over Q for like, rational numbers. <clears throat> but this does not mean six divided by whatever follows. Okay? That's not how you learn this. What this means is six divided by two times the quantity one plus two. So if you do, if you do the parentheses first, three, you end up with six divided by two times three, which is three times three equals nine. Now, um, you want to see some examples of this. Okay, so example, in this particular example here, and I'll, I'll make it larger for you guys to see here, just in case. All right, so this is a fifth grade from mathgoodies.com. This is a fifth grade example. Um, and it says evaluate three plus six times, this is, by the way, uh, this is times, not multiply, right? Again, you have to know what you're looking at. And this is why things are confusing. If you say, oh, look, this is six X. This is not six X, this is six times. Remember, this is, Fifth grade math, they use what's called precept upon precept. And a lot of times they do have a what's called a hermetic approach. Or I mean, I mean a heuristic approach. And a heuristic approach is basically, look, it may not be exactly right, but we want you to understand the concepts first. A lot of people have had calc had the same thing. I mean, when you took calc one uh, and you learned the power rule, most of you guys didn't have to derive the power rule until later on, right? They just said, hey, it works. And when I was in nuke school, a lot of times they said, hey, uh, you may not understand this, but, you know, when you get further into it, you will, right? So, um, so in this example here, this is not saying divide by using the obelisk 3 minus 7, right? It's not saying all this on this side is the top half of what's called a horizontal bar or a veniculum is two words used to describe to that. It's not saying this side divided by this side. It is saying 3 plus 6 times this quantity divided by three minus seven. So if you use PEMDAS, the first thing you do is parentheses, correct? So once you do the parenthetical group, you end up with this, this, this uh, expression. Then you do the multiplication, 
right? Which is nine, nine times six, which is 54. Then you do the division, which is 54 divided by three, not 54 divided by three, whatever, whatever follows, right? It, it, even it, if, you, if you had a parentheses around this group, then you do it that way, but you do not. You do it to the next operator, always in algebra. Uh, uh, terms are, are, are separated by, by oper operators, right? So here's, we have an operator seven, that's a different term. In the six divided by two parentheses one plus two, there is an operator there. It is a multiplication operator. Oh, you don't see the mouse, it's okay. Um, sorry, I, I may have that turned off. You, you can still follow along. So um, then you do the addition, which is three plus 18, and then you do the subtraction, you end up with 14. That is the expected solution. Now, if you notice here on, the, on another example, three, let me blow it up here. This again, from math goodies. Uh, if you want to go check it out, blow it up here. This is a little bit different. This has parentheses first, then it has division, then it has multiplication, and then subtraction and addition. But you say, whoa, it's PAMDAS. It has to be multiplication first. No, again, it is division and multiplication depending on the order it is read from left to right. This is not saying nine minus five divided by whatever follows. Right? Yeah, I'm, I, it's just habit for me using it as a pointer, but I realize it doesn't. Now, if you, if you actually look at what PEMDAS is actually saying, right, this tells you this. It tells you that PEMDAS is the same as BODMOS or BIDMOS or BEDMOS. All of them are the same thing. It doesn't matter if you have P-E-M-D-A-S or P-D-D-M-S-A. The only thing you have to do first, well, you, again, don't have to, but if you want to get the right solution for sure, uh, is, P, is the parentheses, the parenthetical group, right? Any kind of exponentiation, or you can call them orders. Some people call them indices. If you have a bid MOS, right? But bode MOS stands for order, orders. Uh, multiplication or division as read left to right, and ANS as led, read left to right. So the question really is this. If you have this math problem here, what convention do you use? Do you use standard order of operations or do you use implicit multiplication? It's higher than explicit. Well, reality, you can use either, okay? However, generally you assume standard order operations unless told otherwise. And again, as demonstrated, if you go look at a fifth grade or sixth grade math arithmetic uh, quiz and they use this type of notation, the expected answer is nine. So people telling people there's one, they're not helping anybody out because they're not, uh, they're not explaining we're using a different convention such as implied versus, or implicit versus explicit or higher than explicit. One of the reasons for this, for example, if I have a coefficient, let's say a coefficient of a fraction of one half x, the way I denote that is one slash, which is called a solidus, right? One slash two x. That's not representing a horizontal bar. That's not representing a, a what's called a vaniculum. It's not one over two x. It is one half or 0.5 x. Now again, there are other journals that don't use that convention. They may tell you that a variable like x is bonded to its coefficient higher than two, let's say uh, two integers, two times three. With, well, if I have two parentheses three, well, that's implicit multiplication, right? They may say that's a higher order of operation rather than two with a multiplication sign of three. So two X is considered to be one unit if you use that convention. Again, if you use that convention, that convention is not stated to be used here. So uh, this is why, again, the, and one thing is definitely for, for sure, when you're talking about objectivity, right? Math is objective. And this is my lesson for objectivity. If you use standard order of operations, right? That only solves for nine. Remember, a linear equation can only solve for uh, one, equi one solution, no solutions, or an infinite number of solutions. That's it, All right? This can't have multiple solutions, except if it's infinite. So standard order of operations, this can only solve for nine. There should be nobody that can test that. Nobody should contest that, because that's just an objective fact of math, right? That's the difference. I see a lot of people say, well, um, you know, it's, 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 if you use standards, it's not objectively true. Well, absolutely it is. If you use standard, or, or standard order of operations, 
is represented by this. There's only one standard. That's the name of Think of it as a proper name. There's only one standard order of operations. It doesn't mean it, it is the standard as far as a journal. A journal might use a different notation, right? That's completely fine. As long as it tells you, we're going to be using a different convention. So if you see this written this way, we're going to convey to you that one, one slash two X is one over two X. They can do that. Perfectly fine to do that. But you have to be able to be, be, be recognized that, that that's the way the journal's using that notation. So, uh, checking DMs. You want me, you want me to check DMs? I got like a thousand things going on here. Um, what am I looking at here? Um, uh, the order, uh, his, how, so you're showing the, the order of operations in Denmark, which is exactly the same. It's left as red, left to right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the order of operations doesn't matter where your locale is, right? If you're in Denmark, Sweden, Germany, Mexico, notation might different. Might be, like, for example, like in the United States, we use decimals. And foreigners hate that. They, they literally hate that you use decimals to, uh, to or excuse me, commas to denote things. Um, like like 3,000, comma, 3, comma, 0, 0, 0 to us is 3,000, right? But other places use that as a decimal. And it drives them nuts. Again, convention. That's it. That's all it is. It is a matter of, of your convention, of the notation. So you have to be able to understand the different conventions, different notation. There's no one set way. There's nobody says you must do it this way, right? Is there a rule in math that three comma zero 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 must mean three thousand, or can it be three point zero zero zero? Right? It could mean either, depending on what convention you're using. That's all. But the standard is, at least in the Americas, is that you see three comma zero zero zero. It's representing three thousand, right? Yeah. So, um, let's see here. Um, and again, yeah, a lot of this is parsing. But uh, but again, the problem is, is is that people have learned that implicit over explicit, and they think that is the norm, and it's not. It is absolutely not. It's actually uh, mostly common only in engineering. The reason being, or physics, and the reason being is. That when you're inputting something in a calculator, it is easier to write it that way in inline notation. I prefer that when I'm using calculations. But Nuke School doesn't use it like that. And and in pure maths, you're not going to find that because it violates rules. There's certain rules, like I, I showed on the, on, if you looked on the, my Twitter when I was talking about this problem, the transitivity problem, or the transit problem, the transitivity property. It violates this if you, according to what I was showing, because you're actually adding in additional brass, brackets here. Uh, if you want to make this one, if you want to make this a problem to resolve for one, it's actually divided, six divided by the quantity, two div parentheses one plus two, which requires brackets around it. Since there's no brackets around this, you can't assume that's a quantity. It is. It does change it. Um, now, people will notice, you know, well, why don't you just write it, you know, unambiguous? Sure. But again, most of these, are, you only find the obelisks in elementary school math, right? You don't follow, find the obelisks anywhere else but basic arithmetic. So you're not going to find the obelisks used at a college level. And ISO actually forbids the use of the uh, uh, obelisks. So which is the, uh, the you know, standards, industry standards, uh, they do not allow obelisks to be used because it is confusing. But the reason why this problem is, keeps coming up over and over and over again is it wants people to have at each other's throats because they, one person will argue nine, one person will argue one, and then people will like try to explain it like myself, and, and, and you know it doesn't go over very well because I'm trying to explain them. Look, by standard over operations, this is nine. By implicit over explicit, it is one. On a standardized test, at least in, in America, especially in California, because I, I mean I've, I've found multiple examples years ago. I haven't really gone through it that much recently, but you can go look. If, you're, if your child is in a California school and it sees this problem, the expected answer is nine. That is an objective fact. If you don't believe me, write to the Council of Education, write to Common Core, they'll tell you that's the, the case. Um, but again, it's precept upon precept. They want kids to understand the concepts. Uh, it isn't until later on you even start learning about things like more advanced things of numbers and, and integers and rationals and, and complex numbers. I mean, I still this, to this day have, to have a hard time explaining to people why reals are a subset of, of, of complex numbers. You know, if you think about it, reals are a subset of the complex plane, which is confusing to a lot of people. Complex numbers are confusing. 
Uh, even I admit that. As a matter of fact, I never really even had a, a concept of complex numbers until much later on in life where I started thinking about, about as, as a rotation around the x-axis, right? So when you're dealing with torque problems, uh, in Nuke you do a lot of torque problems. Like if you have a wrench and you want to put it on a, a bolt and you got a specific torque and you got a specific cosine of the angle. So if you have a, uh, a if you have a, a, a let's say a, a torque bar, and my torque bar is at a 90% angle and I'm pushing on it, I'm not, you know, it's not adding anything to it. But if I have that torque bar here and I extend the length of it, it's going to add a lot more torque to it, right? The length of the, the bar increases the amount of torque because I have a lot of, I have more rotational energy, right? But that's done on the complex plane, actually. Uh, but all real numbers come from the complex. So... All right, let me look at the, kind of the live chat here to see what you guys kind of add on this. So far, is this making sense to a lot of people? You don't have to agree with me so far, as far as like this being one or nine, but what I've explained so far, does this at least make sense? And do you at least agree that using standard order of notations, this does resolve to nine? There's just no other option for it. I mean, it's, again, it cannot be one using standard order of operations. This is where I see a lot of people make their mistake. They're like, well, PEMDAS solves this as one. No, it doesn't. That is just fundamentally wrong. That is an objective mathematical fact. The subjectivity comes in and which convention do you want to use? But you cannot say that PEMDAS evaluates for this for one, because now you are violating objective mathematical facts. That's the difference. And by the way, I am having a um, uh, Death Wish coffee today. Uh, I'm out of instant, so I made my own homemade brew thing because my coffee pot broke. Uh, it didn't like broke, it just got so bad that I just didn't want to use it. Um, but I, I, I'm drinking what's called Death Wish Coffee. I don't think you guys ever heard it before, but it's like the highest legal caffeine you can get in coffee. All right. So, so far, are people agreeing with me? Hope so. I hate to ban people. Just kidding. You can disagree with me all you want. <laughs> um, uh, so what's your guys' questions on this? Again, these videos don't get a lot of views. I don't expect them to. Um, I do them because they're fun. I do them because I enjoy them. And I'm going to continue to do them. And I hope that my Patreons and the people that subscribe to this channel like this kind of content in addition to some of the other things. This is a, a catch-all channel. Yes, it's dedicated to science, philosophy, math, and everything. Obviously, I talk a lot about the non sequitur case and other things. But I, I prefer this kind of stuff over anything else. It's not the most lucrative by any means. Um, but whatever. But I do hope that people become a Patreon. If you become, you know, a, a member of the channel, you get a cool green name. If You know, especially if I like this kind of stuff because... Hopefully, I'll be doing more of this um, in the future. I've been doing quite a bit more philosophy and science, I think, uh, as of lately. But if you guys need to watch my video on, uh, what was it, uh, was it Friday? I think it was Friday, wasn't it? Yeah, it's was Friday, where I did a video on, um, um, what was it on? <laughs> I did a philosophy video. Somebody reminded me. <laughs> All my videos blur together. Um, it was a video on... Good grief. What did I do a video on? Um, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hunter's Dilemma. Uh, and that was a Braxton Hunter who has a PhD in philosophy. He had a little interesting take on, on something that I, I decided to weigh in on. And by the way, he did message me. He did watch it. And Dr. Hunter liked it. He said I, th he thought I did a really proper, fine analysis and very fair analysis. So, uh, Chief Feeling says, can you open and discuss the link I sent earlier? The math doctors. Yeah, I can look at it. Um, let me, do you want me to, do you want me to like add this in to the, um, to the stream here, Intrigue Feline, or you want me to just read it? What, what, what do you want me to do on this? Is this something you want me to add to the actual stream so people can see it? These were, um, yeah, let me, uh, let me add this real quick, uh, one second. So I can go through it with you guys. Uh, window capture. This is what Intrigue Feline wants me to add here. Okay. Let me make this a little larger here. Okay. So this is the has order, for, order of Operations Historical Caveats. This is from um, Dave Peterson, I guess. I don't know who he is, but we'll look at it. 
Um, they say, uh, to finish up the long series on the order of operations, I want to look at where the rules come from. And notice the quote on the rules. And again, I had this discussion earlier with somebody. What makes a rule as opposed to an, uh, uh, a convention, right? To me, rules are set forth by axiomatic distinctions. And again, just the way I look at it, right? I mean, the, ra the way you look at a, um, a rational number, it is actually defined axiomatically as P over Q, with the greatest common denominator being 1 over 1, where Q does not equal 0, right? You cannot have 0 in the denominator for rational numbers. So 1 over 0 is undefined because it's undefined because of axiomatic um, distinctions. And so those are rules that you cannot divide by 0 because of, there's, a, there's actually a go rule to look at. Uh, Jamie Russell, five dollars. Talk about Hunter's dilemma, please. Well, I, I already did last Friday, so I don't want to get back into that, Jamie. I appreciate the the super chat very much, um, but that's not the topic of this particular discussion. But I found it to be, you know, something cool to talk about. But go go watch my video on that and let me know. Uh, all right, so um, the rules are only descriptive. Um, first, here are a couple paragraphs from the 2017 answers I discussed last time. The transition to the final topic. Um, and I, no, I think the rules are prescriptive, but uh, whatever. Uh, in talking to the extra juxtaposition, again, what I told you, implied multiplication by juxtaposition, rule taught in some textbook. I point out, what many people don't realize is that the, what the, quote, rules we teach are only attempt to describe what mathematicians did for a very long time without explicitly stating what the rules they were following. They do not prescribe what inherently must be done, a priori. In just the same way, English grammar came along came long after the English itself and has sometimes been taught in a way that is inconsistent with actual practice in an attempt to make language seem perfectly rational. Okay, in that case, those are descriptions, yes. I do agree with that. PEMDAS is a description of notation. Um, there's no rule that you have to use PEMDAS. Um, there is a rule, however, you cannot divide by zero. That's not descriptive. Descriptive. That is prescriptive. Don't divide by zero or bad things happen. Okay? You think what happened in 2020 was bad? Divide by zero and let me know. Okay? It's not good. Don't do it. But believe it or not, there are other conventions where you can divide by zero, right? In, in, in actual mathematics, there are some ways you can divide by zero. Of course, there's a uh, hospital's rule. Um, there's one way where you can use uh, certain types of limits to divide by zero. But even more specifically, there's a way to divide by zero and what's called a complex plane to get a what's called complex infinity. So if, if you look, and again, this is way beyond my level. I'm just throwing this out there. Go ask an actual mathematician. But if you look at a Riemann sphere, the top of the Riemann sphere, the north pole of a Riemann sphere is 1 over 0, which is called complex infinity. Um, and you don't break math that way. So it can be done, but it's not in the reals, right? You're, you're now, obviously, uh, if you're dealing with a complex sphere, you're no longer in the reals. Reals are a subset of complex, but complex are not a subset of reals. Um, so at this point, I refer to the post I'll be discussing below on the history of the order of operations. And I, I, then I concluded that I can... That I concluded. In my opinion, the rules are taught, usually taught, are not the best possible description of how expressions are evaluated in practice. This is supported by a recent correspondent who found articles from the early 20th century arguing that the rules newly taught in schools misrepresent what mathematicians actually did back then. Things have changed um, since the 1600s. There's been things in flux. Some some um, mathematicians back in the 1600s used one notation. Some used another. It was very confusing if you go back and read a lot of the things. Um, unfortunately, for decades, schools have taught PEMDAS as if it must be taken literally. I agree, and that is wrong. It should not be taken literally. That is a mistake that they make. So that one must do all multiplications and divisions from left to right, even when it's entirely unnatural to do so. Uh, again, I think it's a convention. And again, I, did, I showed earlier that you could actually solve the same equation without having to do the parenthetical group first, but by do division first, and you get the right answer. Uh, let's see here. Um, the, the, the better textbooks have avoided such trickery expressions, but others actually drill students in these awkward cases as if were important. I agree with that, actually. I don't know if I want to go through this whole thing, but it sounds like if somebody wants to read this, um, called The Order of Operations, historical, um, it probably is putting out, yeah, it's, it's the 1600s, yeah, same as that, exactly as I said. Um, and the distributed property here, the, you know, it's funny that I mentioned distributed property, because a lot of people say, well, if you, if you distribute this, Right? If you distribute the 2 over 1 plus 2, you have to remember something. Distribution is multiplication over addition here. Let me repeat that. Distribution is multiplication over addition here. 
Multiplication is an operator. Division and multiplication are the same hierarchy. If you want to do, do distribution here, you cannot distribute the two over the parenthetical group one plus two until the division operator is resolved first. Because division comes first here, read left to right. So the proper way, the, the standard way for you to do this, if you wanted to use distribution, which is perfectly fine, is but you have to remember, it is a multiplication operation. And you have to remember that multiplication and division have the same hierarchy. So the proper way to do it would be six divided by two is three. Then you distribute the three over the one over the two, um, one plus two, which is multiplication over addition. Three times one is three. Three times two is six. Six plus three is nine. There you go. Uh, Lord Loki, CHF, $5. Could you plug it in Wolfram Alpha and click on one step by step solution? I like that, and it shows the fraction. Um, I, I can do it in, in Wolfram Alpha. The problem is I don't have step by step solution. I don't have that kind of account. Uh, but I mean, I could, I, I have Wolfram Alpha here. For example, like this particular problem, it does show that it's, it's, th it's 14, right? And so if you do the six divided by two, uh, I, I, the obelisk is going to be the same thing, so don't worry about the obelisk, right? It does come up with nine. Now, again, it does parse it this way, right? Just keep in mind that it, it, this parses it the way uh, you would find in uh, many different types of languages, not just um, Wolfram Alpha, but it, in a, um, what is it called? Um, uh, Python uses it this way, and other, other types of uh, uh, systems, they'll parse it this particular way. Um, but like I said, this has to equal nine. I mean, true. And, and Wolfram Alpha did change this at one point. They used to have the convention that implied multiplication was a higher precedence. Oh, I haven't changed it yet. I'm sorry, you didn't. Here we go. Now you guys can see it. My bad. Let me uh, make this larger so you can see it. Let me let me do this and. There we go. Now you guys should be able to see this just fine. Um, so now you, you can actually see that this actually does work this way. Um, if if I if I put a parentheses around this, right? If I put this as a bracket, and I use brackets only because it's just d d easier to read. A bracket and a parentheses here mean the same thing. They're both parenthetical groupings. However, in other types of mathematics, a bracket and a parentheses do mean different things as far as like range and domain. You guys remember way back when um, a range that has a parentheses doesn't include that number, but it, uh, if you have a bracket, it does. So th these symbols mean different things in different cases, right? All right, uh, just like uh, like a dot. A dot can mean a multiplication in some type in some maths. You might see three dot six, which means three times six, or you might use a dot product for a vector, which is a completely different thing. Uh, by the way, I'm trying to look at the live chat as I'm doing this too, which is quite difficult because it's covering this is covering up my live chat, so I can't see the live chat at the second. Um, uh, let me go back to my live chat here for a second. Eh. Yeah, I wish I had that step by step. I do know people that have Wolf Malfam that have offered me to use it, but I don't know. Um, click on the step by step solution. Um, sure, one sec. Uh, I don't think it's gonna give me much, but we'll see. Maybe it will. Ah, I, I guess it. I guess it does enough, right? So in this full uh, uh, solution, it's, it's literally saying, let me go back to the, uh, there we go. Hang on one sec, let me go back to the, this. Right, so, so the exact result is nine. And in, in the step-by-step -step solution, it is six um, over six quantity one plus two over two. And this is another way of writing it, right? Because this is saying that six over two is your coefficient of the quantity one over one plus two. These are the same things. This is exactly the same. This is what this is saying. This, this will give you the exact same thing. Both will give you nine. See, it's just different way of writing it for the inline notation. But if I had something like this, and this is where the transitivity pro, uh, property came in when I was explaining it to somebody, because some master's engineer person was like, "Well, what about this?" And they had it something like uh, uh, I don't know. I think it was like. Uh, Divided by 
Yeah, what was it? I'm trying to think what they had. Um, uh, I think it was just something like this, um, which of course, you know, is, is eight. And they're like, well, if, well, no, what was it? Um, oh, I know what it was, two plus four. And they said, well, if I factor out a two of this, I end up with six divided by, um, uh, six divided by, they, they thought this would be the case. This is what it was. Um, but this doesn't work this way, all right? I'm gonna explain to you why. They thought this was gonna be the case. And it's false. The reason being is if you factor out the two here, right? You factor out the two from the quantity, you got, you, 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 you're assuming that this is a parenthetical group. If that's a parenthetical group, then this has to be a parenthetical group. And then you're gonna get a true statement. So if you, if you have something like this, and you factor out the two, you can't make it like that. That's gonna, that's gonna be false. You have, there's an implied bracket around all of this, right? Even the number six has implied parentheses. Any, any expression has implied outer brackets to it. It doesn't change anything. Uh, let me add here. It doesn't change your order of operations, right? You get as many of them you want. And that's the thing. You have to understand that the six divided by nine, or six divided by two, one plus two, is equal to nine because it, there's no brackets here. That's the only way it'll equal to one. And I think a lot of people just don't, they look at something and they see this, and they see this slash and they say, oh, it has to be six over this, and it's not. If you look at the step-by-step -step solution, if you look at the step-by-step -step solution, it tells you that it's not. Let me go back to my live chat real quick. All right, so where are we at there? Um, does that make sense to you guys? I mean, again, this, this problem is designed to make people insane. Uh, it, it, it does have a proper solution using standard orders. Uh, it only solves for one if you use a different convention, which is implicit multiplication by juxtaposition having a higher order of, or operations over explicit. That's not standard, though. It's not, the, excuse me, it's not the standard over operations. And I've demonstrated that if you go look at in any kind of elementary school teachings, any kind of arithmetic level, they want the student to resolve this as nine. They want it to solve a nine. And I don't think you're doing anybody good by saying, oh, well, it's one because I learned in my engineering class it's one. Well, that's because you learned a different convention, which is perfectly fine to use. But you have to be able to understand the distinction between the two different types of convention. And to say that PEMDAS, or standard order operations, solves this as one, that is objectively wrong, right? And that's where the objectivity comes in. There is an objective measure to be had. Math is not subjective. Math is objective. Now, the subjectivity in which convention you use, but that's a different case. Um, now, well, and let me point out that Wolfram Alpha does kind of switch between the two. There are actual things in different. Wolfram Alpha doesn't always use PEMDAS. It actually can, sometimes will use implicit multiplication by juxtaposition. It, it does do that. I've actually found that to be the case. So, again, you have to kind of know the concepts, right? If you start using variables with Wolfram Alpha, it might give you a different example because it, it sometimes, it doesn't always do this. I found this out. I've tested it many times it doesn't always attach a higher order of, of operations to the variable. Um, so, you just gotta be real careful on that. Again, it's, it's conceptual stuff, right? Um, symbol, yeah, Symbol Lab uses step-by-step. -step. Yeah, I recognize that. Now again, we have a lot of math people in the audience right now. God's Auditor, I'm not gonna like... Well, you know, he put it on his Facebook the other day. Yeah, he's a, he's a smart dude. He's got a double major. He, he's doing engineering and mathematics, so I don't think that's given too much information about him. He's a smart dude. He takes, like, he, he's put it out on Twitter. He's taking Calc 4 level stuff, okay? So, I mean, uh, I know Nazareth understands math, and I know that Intrigue Feline understands math. Um, uh, let's see here. I think Jamie Russell, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Uriah Christensen definitely understands math. He's really one of the best people I know for, like, layperson logic. Um, Jamie is an is engineer. <laughs> is, are you an engineer, Jamie? Um, let's see here. Any any non math people? I know anybody in my I know Deep Ashtray kind of knows some of this stuff. Uh, do I have any person in my my live chat right now that just hates math or doesn't understand any of this? They probably wouldn't be watching if they did. 
No, it looks like most people that I... P equals NP. Um, yeah, and by the way, it's not just Symbol Lab, too, uh, guys out there. Uh, Tiger Algebra is pretty good for certain stuff, too. Yeah. Yeah. So... So Deep says, back in my college days, it would have been six over two. Well, again, that might have been your course, right? If you take an engineering course, they might evaluate it that way. They, or in this case, solve it because of the equation. But that's not how, if I just look at this problem, you can't just assume implicit multiplication by juxtaposition. Now, I had, a, I had a conversation with Elizabeth Stapleton, or Elizabeth Staple from Purple Math on this very topic. And... Uh, you know, she agreed that there's no set convention. She prefers implicit versus explicit. She's one of the very few mathematicians I've ever met in my life that do prefer that. Um, and I say mathematicians versus uh, an engineer or physics person because they tend to not be in pure math as a mathematician would. But uh, um, she is only like one of two mathematicians I think I've ever met. Actually, there was a mathematician on the other day uh, on Twitter that said there's one, but everybody was even correcting them. They're like, no. So... Let's see here. By the way, this is really good coffee, this Death Wish. Uh, uh, Justin Franks, he's a math guy. He actually teaches math. So, let me give a quick um, straw poll here. How many of you, I'm going to ask two different questions, and I want two different answers. So the first question is, how many of you agree that using standard order of operations, which would be PEMDAS, this solves for 9? Put 9 or 1, depending on, on your answer. And then I'll ask my second question. Um, Eric says, only, became, only came because it's interesting engineering background and PhD in physics. I would never write like that because it's bound to confuse. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, if you've got a PhD in physics, message me on Twitter. I like to, uh, I like to collect PhDs. Um, people know that about me. They're like, Steve always cites PhDs. That's an argument from authority. You're damn right it is. They worked hard to get a PhD. I'm going to cite them if they support my argument. And if they don't, I'm going to tell them why they're wrong. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, you're actually right, Eric. Look, I, I, I think it's horrible that people write these kinds of equations so ambiguously. I get that. I would never write these equations uh, at all. But again, most of them are tailored to have a student understand things uh, Concept-wise, do I think that they should maybe reevaluate how they're doing that? Yeah, I do. Um, I think it lends to ambiguity, and the reason why is because later on you learn things that changes that. But again, hey, look, I still feel like my my entire childhood was a lie because when I learned, and this was like sixth grade, that a meteor when it hits the atmosphere, it burns up because of friction. That is a lie. I was lied to. Um, it isn't because of pr uh, friction. It's because it was called ram pressure. It ablates the outer, uh, heats up the outer uh, layer of the meteor. That meteor ablates the outer, you know, and it burns off. And then you're left with a cold meteor right when it hits the ground. It has nothing to do with friction. It has to do with compressing the air in front of it. So that ram pressure, if you, if you change the volume of a gas, what happens with quantitative analysis is V goes down, T goes up. If you look at Charles' law or Boyle's law, that's a function of physics. We have a physicist in the live chat. I'm sure he'll hopefully agree with that. If not, then i got to review my, my, <laughs> my stuff from nuke school. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was lying about that, right? I mean, it's just, you know, I feel like that... You know, I should have been told the truth, but I don't think in sixth grade maybe I would have understood something like a ram pressure, right? So, but I still think it was right for them to tell me it was friction. That's just wrong. Uh, well, yeah, there was something else the other day, too, I, that I was told. Um, it reminded me of something I was told as a kid that wasn't true growing up, but I, I can't think of it right now. Um, yeah, the other thing God's Auditor talks about right now is he says, they wrote it this way because it wouldn't go viral otherwise. Yes, I told you. This is a way just to get people out of each other's throats. I've had people block me because of this. Um, it's the same reason why we use 0.99 repeat equals 1 instead of 0.99 bar equals 1, because people would know bar means something else, and that might be true. But then again, they might use, say 0.99 bar still isn't equal to 1. Right? Even though it is, right? We know it is, right? We understand 0.99 repeating is the same number as one. Uh, I have had numerous videos of those in the past. Maybe I'll do another one next week if people just want to have some fun with it because um, it's one of my favorite things. The reason why it's one of my favorite things is objectivity. When I try to convince something of somebody or when I try to you know, be as persuasive to somebody, if they don't have the ability to change their mind on something that is objectively true, how am I going to get them to change their mind on anything else, objective or subjective, right? 
they won't, they're, in, they're in transit at that point, in transit at that point. They, they, they can't change their mind. If, if you, you say, look, I'm looking at something that is objectively true, and I don't believe it. I don't accept it. I have a hard time with that. So 0.99 repeating equals 1 is an objective fact. There's no ambiguity there. There's no, oh, well, you know, way I learned it. No, it is a true statement, period. 0.99 repeating was going to one. And so I, I try to explain this to me. Well, this is math. Let me explain to you the math, whether I use geometric progression, let me use uh, algebra, let me use calculus. If you don't understand it and you're still telling me I'm wrong, after I've demonstrated to use using mathematical proofs and evidence, you're not a critical thinker at that point, I don't think. And I'm not going to bother with them trying to explain to them anything else. That is my litmus test, just personally what I use. You guys could find something else that's objective, right? Um, this is not an objective case as far as here. The objectivity here is only if you use standard order operations, PEMDAS, then it solves for nine. That is objective fact, right? Doesn't mean you have to use PEMDAS though. Um, yeah, Eric says, could be described by using the, the analogy how your bicycle pump becomes warmer uh, warm when you pump. Could be more intuitive to describe your meteor description. Yeah, ground pressure is obviously a little bit different, as you know. But yeah, same principle. If you have a container, um, there's something called Pascal's pressure law, which we all had to memorize in nuke school. If Dapper Dino or um, a couple other nukes that I know um, come around, they'll tell you Pascal's pressure law is, is ingrained in your brain. And Pascal's pressure law is the... the um, an uh, the pressure exerted on an enclosed fluid at rest will be transmitted equally and undiminished throughout the fluid into the walls of this container. We are, we are ingrained that. We have to memorize that statement like in our sleep. I, I, it's been, what, 25, 30 years, however long it's been, I still have that memorized to this day. So if you have a, if you have a tire, right, and you increase the pressure in that tire, on the walls of the container, you're going to have more molecules per cubic centimeter. And so the temperature is going to go up. You're, excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Uh, if, you, if your volume goes down, your temperature is going to go up. If you expand it, your temperature is going to go down because you have less molecules sitting in the walls of the container. So it's inversely proportional in that particular case. Um, also the same way with if you increase the temperature using quantitative analysis, increase temperature, what happens to your container? It wants to expand. This is what happens if you take a balloon, a weather balloon, and you shoot it up in the atmosphere. Pressure is diminished on the outside. Pressure isn't the same on the inside. It's going to start expanding, right? So if you were to, to change the temperature of a balloon and heat it up, it's going to start expanding. This is why a tire will bust if it gets too hot and you have a high pressure. It, it, it can't withstand that because of Pascal's pressure law. Diesel combustion is, is not kind of, well, diesel combustion is, is similar. Yeah, the way diesel combustion would work, uh, Josiah, uh, excuse me, Justin, is that when you compress a, a gas, a diesel fuel mixture, right, it heats up. And when it heats up and you ignite it, well, actually, that's, that's not, there's no ignition in diesel. It's a mere compression causes it to, to, to ignite. Um, on a combustion engine, you have a spark plug that does the ignition. But on a diesel engine, yes, when you heat, when you pressure it together, it self ignites because it's, it heats up to the point where it has self ignition. Uh, uh, William Pye, he's a mathematician. I see, I, you know, it's weird. I do these videos on math and all the math people come up, but all the, the people want the other stuff, they don't even come by. They're like, oh, I ain't going to watch that Steve guy do math stuff. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait for the uh, drama stuff and then say when, when Steve has something about non sequitur, oh, Steve does drama. <laughs> you know, it's hilarious, man. I, I, I'd much rather do these types of videos. I don't care they don't make any money. I, I mean, sure, I mean, I wish they did, but I realize that they don't. But I appreciate the super chats. This is why I'm saying, if if you guys like this kind of content and you like the physics and you like the science, become a member um, or Patreon. I really appreciate it because that's how I, I support myself. Um, so I want to put out good content. I want to put out content that people watch like this for people that want to watch it, like the people that like math. I don't want the drama crowd. I don't want the the, the uh, commentator crowd. I don't want the, the, the those types. I mean, sure, if they like math, but I'm not sucking up to big creators. I don't want those types of people. They just come over and cause havoc uh, for the most part. Um, I'd rather have the people that want to talk about the interesting things, science, physics, math, flat earth, uh, anti-flat earth kind of stuff. So, uh, Benfer's law, Trump forever. Yeah, I don't know if that, you know, look, I I, I know somebody did, matter of fact, the mathematician that did a video on Benfer's law was the math guy I just told you about who thinks it solves for one. Um, I didn't watch his video. Uh, Benfer's law is basically, I did take accounting, by the way, People may remember Benfer's law is that 
the way they look for cookbooks is that there should be a, a certain distribution of numbers, and it's not a normal distribution like you would think. Um, there should be there, when when you're looking at the cookbooks, you, you people tend to use certain numbers, and it's not you know a random distribution. And so if if you see some kind of statistical anomaly using Benford's law, you can tell that the books have been cooked rather than a normal um, what you would normally find for accounting. Would that be the best way to explain that, Jamie? Um, but I don't know if that worked for Trump's um, books. You know what they were doing. What were they doing on the the votes? They were doing on the uh, votes. Whether there's a, a normal distribution for votes using Benford's law. Um, yeah, I, have, I haven't watched it. Is that? I wonder if that's the video for the 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 math guy I was I was talking talking to on the Twitter. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, that is stand up math. Yeah, I think that's the guy. Maybe. Yeah, he's got a lot of views, but he actually said, you know, this was one. I think that's the same guy I was talking to on Twitter, wasn't it? I don't know, the icon looks the same. I don't remember. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good math people. I look, I have a guy, friend who has Epic Math Time. If you go check him out, he has great content. Um, I love, uh, was it one, one blue, three brown? Brilliant. Brilliant. Matter of fact, I got to tell you. Even though I had digital signal processing years ago, this was Monia stuff, um, and I had, I had a RAM radio license when I was 13. Uh, KB6HSZ was my call sign, even though I really never used it. But we have to learn, you got to learn, you know, things about antennas and waveguides and, um, you know, two meter bands and 144 megahertz stuff. And, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, so digital signal processing. Um, Oh, where was I going with this? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I, I, you, you have something called what a Fourier transform, right? And a Fourier transform takes something from the time domain and puts it to the frequency domain, and allows you to, to extract specific um, individual signal components from a composite wave function, right? So if I have a waveform like an audio function, by using a Fourier Fourier transformation, I can I can I can tease out the individual waveforms that went into that. So it's very confusing. It's not very easy. But I got to tell you, until I watched the one brown, three blue, I, I didn't have, I, I thought I kind of understood it. But that video they did on four year, that he did on four year trans, uh, transformations, where he's talking about the winding frequency and how to explain the going from the frequency of the domain using the winding frequency, I was like, <gasps> oh, it clicked. It, it was like, oh my God, I wish I would have known this. 30 years ago, where were you? You know, where were you 30 years ago? Where was the internet 30 years ago? I mean, it's brilliant when somebody can do that. When somebody can video and go, wow, I get, get it now with the winding frequency. And I get it now with how you convert it from the frequency to the, to the, to the, to the time domain. Because when I took, learned some about this stuff in, in calculus or uh, radio communication, I just, I got to tell you, most of it was just rote memorization, straight up. Um, I'm um, serious. He says, if you set it to stream to ultra low latency, it's easier to converse with the chat. Yeah, I know, but I, I like normal latency. I don't, I don't set it to ultra low. Um, God's auditor, you because you, you can get dropouts. Uh, you should get into matrix algebra. <laughs> I, I, I have matrix, right? I mean, I'm not going to do matrix algebra. No, I mean, and, and there's a couple things that I just don't get into, right? Um, matrix algebra, ring theory. Uh, even epistemological logic, way beyond my ability to comprehend, and am I going to attempt it? I like to say in my comfort level. Uh, my, my channel is basically the channel of, hey, look, you have this dude that has a little bit of, of stuff that he's taken, uh, knows a little bit about some stuff, he likes talking about it, he's a lay person, and if this dude can understand it, you can understand it. That's, that's my whole thing for this channel. If I can understand some of this stuff, Anybody else to be able to understand it for the most part, right? That that's just my goal is that a, a lay person talking about some of this stuff, and then people can agree, they can disagree, and, and if you have somebody who knows more, they can say, "Steve, you got this wrong. Here's how you fix it." Great. Now now I've learned something even better. So the next time I talk about it, I'll get it right. Um, yeah. Let's see here. <laughs> Matrix algebra ring theory. Yeah. Really, see, William. Some if you guys don't want to dox yourself. It's up to you, but if you want to put, you have a PhD or master's or a bachelor's in math or physics, 
uh, go ahead and put in my live chat. I kind of know who has the, the PhDs. And I kind of know who has a major, uh, master's degree. But if you want to, like, shout it out there, be proud of it, man. I, I Dude, for people to get PhDs in this subject, I ha I'm in awe. Uh, even for a master's degree, I'm in awe. I have enough credits for a bachelor's degree. People think I didn't go to college. I did go to college. I had a lot of college courses. I mean, in fact, I had uh, even, um, what is it called when you take a course off the college campus? Ex uh, not extenuated classes, but um, extension classes. I took macro evolution, or, excuse me, macro uh, economics, microeconomics, college algebra, all as an extension class for Texas A&M. Uh, you know, then I took a lot of courses through College of the Desert, and, and uh, there's other courses that I could actually take in what's called Phoenix uh, University if I wanted to go for a degree in nuclear technologies, which I didn't. But I have over 120 credit, credits, accredited, uh, over 120. So for most colleges, you only need 120 some odd credits for a bachelor's degree. So, I mean, essentially I have equivalency to a bachelor's, but yeah, I didn't finish it, so I don't ever do. Oh, and Trey Phelan has a master's degree. I, I thought you had a bachelor's. Huh. Okay, I learned something new. Um, she is smart. She's like wicked smart. But you can tell that somebody has that has some kind of higher education because like when Tweet Feline gets this stuff, she understands concepts. She, she, she'll she take um, a legal thing and just dissect it. She'll take an argument and dissect it. She's been skilled and learned and educated on how to do objective critical thinking. That's great. Um, uh, yeah, Matt, oh, Mr. Sirius says, I took one economics class, so I basically understand how the world works completely. I got to tell you this. In my experience, macroevolution, uh, why do I keep saying macroevolution? I'm so used to like <laughs> dealing with evolution. Macroeconomics was the hardest class I ever took in my entire freaking life. I, I got to be in it. Everything else, I mostly had A's. I, I have, I've shown my dean's list. I had a 4.0 average. But that class through Texas A&M, I got a B. I will tell you right now, and I'm not ashamed of this, I had no idea in the world what the hell I was doing. You asked me to do a Keynesian diagram, supply demand, uh, and, and, a lot, and some of it did use um, cost, uh, you know, what you have a cost and demand and um, price point, and then it was, a, it was basically a differential equation for the most part. I mean, um, I, I just did the motions. It was rote memorization. Uh, and then it was, okay, this is how he told me to do it. This is what I'm doing. Do I understand why the, the curve switch, you know, shifts this way? Do I understand the, you know, the, the cost uh, analysis for a different equation? If, if you do this, no, I had no idea. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> it was very, very hard. Uh, by the way, am I the only one that thinks that way? Cause I got to tell you, it was ridiculous. Um, uh, matrix algebra is easy, <laughs> God Auditor says. Um, just tedious. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I've never, I haven't, I, a lot of that stuff like predicate calculus, dude, and matrix algebra, I haven't really looked into that much. I mean, I, I still get confused what a ring, field, and group is, okay? Or what's called a, a uh, what, what's the very simple one? And so you have a ring, you have a field, you have a group, then you have something that starts with an M. A, a mo, um, 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 uh, was it a modal? Uh, what is it called? What is it called? Um, yeah, and each one has different properties, right? This this has the commutative, com, com, uh, commutative property or commutivity property. This has transitive property. This has associative property. This doesn't. This you know. Um, yeah, it was very confusing. But again, I didn't study it, so that's why why I didn't really have an interest in it. I I, I only like to learn things I have an interest in. Ring theory did not really interest me that much. Holando says, Masters, I was going to get a PhD, but after seeing what they put my friend through, after getting his, changed my mind. It's like joining a frat and professors treat you about the same. Yeah, um, I can imagine that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably hell good if you're trying to get a PhD um, because a lot of it is, you know, a, a, it's just a, a big frat. <laughs> yeah, but it's still hard. I mean, hey, use props. Yeah. Uh, scroll up here. Bring back the apicus. Red Eye, you still count using your fingers. What do you need an apicus for? Um, three blue, one brown. That's what it is, Eric. Thank you. Three blue, one brown. Great channel. Yeah, no, not a module. Uh, no. Um, uh, it's, it's, I, I, I hate, I cannot think for, for life of me what it is. Um, it's a very simple, um, group 
that's in, it's not even called a group because you have a group, you have a field, and you have a ring. But it's the very simple, like the most basic one you can have in, in ring theory. And it starts with an M, and I can't for the life of me think of it. Yeah, I, it's, it, I think it's a unitary group. Man, I hate that when I can't think of a term. I, I don't think I, I don't even remember what it is to look it up. Ring theory um, group field. Nah, it doesn't even have it. Again, it starts with an M, and I just can't for the life of me remember it. Somebody will probably afterwards, up this uploads, will go, oh, it's this. Um, not like it's, 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 what is it, mode, a modal? Monoid, thank you, monoid. Oh, see, it took a, it took the, uh, the, the uh, math guy, the PhD in math, to tell me what it is. Monoid, yes, monoid. See, I don't remember that kind of stuff, right? Mo monad or monoid, yeah, it's a monoid. Um, but again, I'm familiar with the, some of these things enough that I've looked at them and I go, okay, you have a monoid, you have a group, you have a field, um, you know, are, they, are the integers a field or are they group? Uh, are the reals a field? Um, I, I got that much down, right? Um, and I understand things like zero equals one is when you have a multiplicative, or excuse me, the, the zero equals one is the additive identity equals the multiplicative identity for ring theory. But obviously that will not hold true if you're just using regular arithmetic. So this, this, this right here, zero equals one, is actually true. That I just put in the live chat. That actually is true in ring theory because it's not representing the numeral zero, the number zero, and the number one. What that's representing is that the multiplicative identity is equal to, oh, actually I should say the, the uh, additive identity zero which is equal to the multiplicative identity of one. Is that something I do remember when I was reading up on ring theory? Maybe the actual math guy can correct that or not. But So a monoid is a set of binary operation with an associative with an identity element. Yeah. And I do remember that, right? There's identity element to be had with that. It is associative. Um, so it is a binary operator that has both uh, associative properties and an identity element, which would, in this case would be either, um, for example, multiplication has the multiplication identity, which is one. That's why the zero equals one there. Yeah, zero equals one is in, the zero, in, a, in one single ring. I believe it's called the uh, zero ring. Yeah, yeah, the zero ring, and he says, uh, which is the terminal object uh, in the category of rings. Yes, I, and I remember that's a zero ring. Not that I've ever took a course in ring theory, but, yeah. <sighs> well, this was fun. Uh, I don't know what else to do on this particular uh, hangout other than to tell you guys this problem is designed to make people lose their minds. I just want to do a quick hangout on it, um, an hour long. And that way people want to come back and look at this and say, hey, look, if you want to be able to understand this, why this resolves for nine or solves for nine, uh, why there is a, a case to be made for implicit multiplication over explicit, go watch Steve's video. That's all I want. People to watch these videos if they want to learn something and they enjoy it. So I'm going to wrap it up. Any last questions? I want to thank you guys for coming out this morning. It was really early for me, but I was got up early. I slept great. I got up early and I just wanted to do something fun today on Sunday. Um, Hopefully, in, uh, in this week, we're going to get some movement on the non sequitur showcase. I don't know what they're waiting on, um, but that's a whole different stream. Uh, all right, so I, I said I was going to ask two questions. My first question was, using PEMDAS, is this solves for nine? You guys answered that. I think overwhelmingly is line nine. So my, let me ask my last question before I end the stream. Now that you understand this problem, and most of you guys already did, but if you see this viral math problem, and this is all you see, would you evaluate this for nine or one? Because again, without having any extra, explicit instructions to treat this multiplication here, implicit higher than explicit, knowing that this should be, this is actually an equation that you would use on a fifth grade exam. Would you tell somebody this solves for nine or one? And, and I'm gonna say yes, it solves for nine. The reason why I would answer it nine is because if you say it's one, if a student is looking at what you're writing and they say it's one, they're going to get it wrong. And that's my biggest concern, right? If we're here to educate, we're going to be here to, to explain to people these things. We want to be able them to get it right. And, and this is what the question would be asked on a standardized test. The expected answer is nine. Therefore, I think if you see this problem, it should be nine. That's it. Um. 
So Icarus is like the lone hole out. He thinks that two parentheses is a single term. However, there's nothing in that for, for PEMDAS. There's no rule like that. There's nothing in math like that. So, but I think, yeah, Icarus, I think you're the lone hole out there, man. Uh, Justin says, I solved it as nine using the order of operations. I learned in elementary school. Correct. Red Eye, I'm not bringing Edgar on. No, stop it. Stop it. You're, stop. Yeah. A probability of 3.0. Because actually, if I remember, Edgar believes uh, probably greater than 1.4 because of supernatural causation. Don't ask me why I remember that. Um, but, anyways, uh, Doc Fizz says uh, equals nine. This is quite standard to know by the age of nine ish. Yes, right? Just caught here wondering what the topic is this basic. Yes, it, that's as simple as that, Doc Fizz Logan. Um, you know, but I have other math videos. I mean, I have videos on Calc 1, Calc 2. I did, you know, I think I did a pretty good job of my Taylor series video, especially because I haven't had a math course in 25 years. So. And I'm not a math guy. I'm not a mathematician. I am not a math dude. I just happen to know certain things about certain things. And, you know, I just happen to remember a little bit about the Taylor series, and I happen to remember a little bit about basic calc. But if you actually want to solve something, you actually want to learn calc at a higher level, go to somebody like God's Auditor. He actually knows this epically more than I do. Or William, he knows this epically more than I do. Uh, Josh knows this epically more than I do. Again, I'm the layperson. They're the experts. I'm just relating to you that if I can understand Calc 1, Calc 2 basically enough to explain it, then somebody should be able to later learn it. That's the whole goal. And with that, guys, I will see you later on. We're going to have Caffeine Corner tomorrow, hopefully at, at 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific time with Cheshire, I think. I don't know what we're doing tomorrow. I have to get with Chesh. Um, so. Oh, Holando, watch my Taylor series refresher. Awesome. Thank you. Um, if you guys haven't watched that, go to my uh, playlist, find the uh, math videos, and watch the video on Taylor series. It's actually one of my favorites. I enjoyed that so much um, because I was like, hey, I, I, I remember this. This is nice. Um, trying to explain Taylor series, Mercurian series, and, and how to do, you know, like get E. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was fun. How, are you, how am I chemistry? I suck. If you want chemistry, go to GeoStreber. Yes, I butchered his name. I'm going to call him GeoStreber. Um, yeah, I took stoichiometric chemistry, believe it or not. I actually was qualified primary and secondary chemist on the, on the reactor plant. We had to do uh, titrations. We had to do rapidity test. We had to add what's called... Um, disodium and trisodium phosphate to the reactor core system and we had to we had we used silver nitrate for our stupidity test and we had to have an understanding of chemistry um and also i took chemistry also in high school um I, I i forgot a lot of it right i mean maybe i understand the basics i took um well, we had to learn a little about vesper if you guys remember vesper theory for electron orbitals uh and and sigma bonds and pi bonds but uh yeah, for the most part, chemistry is not my thing. The, we, the way we learned chemistry was so pathetically basic, really. If you, if we had to do what's called the railroad things, where uh, unit analysis for using stoich stoichiometric analysis, and here's the equation, how do you balance it, um, you know, that, that's kind of stuff. I mean, we didn't get into the, the real meat of, of, of uh, inorganic chemistry. And, if, and if, by the way, if you start taking organic chemistry, you're in a different field altogether. Inorganic and organic chemistry are, are to, to me, vastly different subjects. Now, to a chemist, they're probably the same thing. But, yeah, they're just... Don't ask me about a benzene ring, okay? I like to stay with things I'm comfortable at. Yeah, I'll never do a video on chemistry unless it's like with Geo Streber and he wants to do something like that. He's he's just got his master's degree in chemistry. Uh, it is definitely one of my weaker fields. Ge uh, I think my weakest field is, is again, probably ge uh, geology. But uh, again, I have an interest in it. I love that subject. I would love to go rock hunting and get a tumbler. Like I used to have a tumbler years ago. And you know you you put your um, polishing solution in, and you would tumble it, and you get these really nice shiny rocks. And I had some petrified wood that I remember. I had some tourmaline, I think it was, and uh, fascinating stuff. I'd love to be able to go out and find some agates and opal and 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 you know quartz. And I like the subject. I'm just not 
in any way proficient at it. I am, would say I am inept when it comes to geology. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. We all have subjects we're inept in. I think that's that's fine. Um, when people say you're inept at something, I don't think there you should be that taken that demeaning. You go, yeah, I would never learned about it. Uh, it's not a subject that I understand. If, if, if you want me to do brain surgery, I'm going to tell you, look, I'm inept at brain surgery. Don't don't let, don't don't let me anywhere near patient to do brain surgery. One, because I'm not a doctor. <laughs> you don't want you don't want somebody who's inept working on your brain, right? Um, uh, anyways, this was fun. I am highly caffeinated. I'd love to continue longer, but I think we've kind of uh, ran the course. Uh, if, if I find something to do later on tonight, I might, but uh, I just want to keep this a little succinct. We've gone 70 minutes, and I think I'm going to kind of end it there. But thank you guys for watching. Again, leave comments. Please share. Please like. Um, Holando and God's Auditor, uh, thank you guys for being members. My moderators, thank you guys for being moderators. Justin, thank you for being a member. Uh, any other members I got out there right now? Uh, I want to make sure I acknowledge people. Muskegon, uh, thank you. Or is it Mus Muskegon? Yeah, I think it is. Um, I like to I like I like to acknowledge people um, when they do become members and they do become Patreons. It means a lot because again, that's a hundred percent of my my income is Patreon and the member stuff. Um, you don't make a lot off ad revenue, I assure you. <laughs> so and the super chats, obviously. So, anyways, guys, thanks for watching this, and we'll see you later.